Classes in Statistical Mechanic. Lectures by Professor George Phillies, based on his book, Elementary Lectures in Statistical Mechanics, Springer Verlag, 2000. And today, this lecture is Lecture 10, Separable Quantum Systems. I'm Professor Phillies, and these are lectures on statistical mechanics. Today I am going to discuss the rest of what we are going to say for the moment about the Grand Canonical Ensemble, and then we are going to advance to discuss quantum mechanics. So, we actually begin with equation 9-20, which gives us the probability of having a bunch of atoms, n of them, n one of them, in a particular set of positions and momenta. And from there, we're going to flip ahead to equation 9.24. 9.24 looks sort of like 9.20, but there have been some drastic changes. First, instead of saying there is one chemical species of indistinguishable particles, there are now several different chemical species. Um, furthermore, and that's oh, why, where do we see the several different chemical species? If you look in the exponential in the numerator of 9-24, there is a summation over script n, because there are now script n different species, each of which has its own chemical potential, and each of which, in each state of the system, has some number n sub i of particles. Uh, this is actually a homework problem that you're at least working on. The, the Q in front of that arises because we're just going to ask what is the likelihood of having three particles of species one, two particles of species two, etc., no matter where they are. So we integrate over all of the positions and all of the momenta of all of the particles because no matter where they are or how fast they're going, we want to include them as contributing to the statement there are the right number of particles in the system. Okay, so that is our likelihood of having a certain number of particles. And now we ask, well, there are different probabilities of having different numbers of particles in the room. What is the likelihood of having some particular combination of number of particles? And so we have several alternatives, one of which is to say we will calculate the average number of particles. But what is actually traditionally done, and it is a perfectly legitimate calculation, is to ask what is the most likely number of particles of each species? If the distribution of particle numbers, if we've got a lot of particles, is very narrow, the most likely state is probably not very different from the average state. Now that could get quite dangerous if the distribution had some exotic shape, but in general it doesn't. And so what we say is we have um, a number of particles and say we are at the most likely state. And so we have Xi1 particles of species 1, Xi2 particles of species 2, etc. We will, then vary, we will then ask how the probability of having the number of particles changes if we vary the number of particles of each species present. So we're going to vary the composition of the system away from its most probable value, and we are going to ask how the probability changes. Yes. If we're at a maximum, of course, it's a maximum for possibly a large number of different variables, the probability is at a maximum, and therefore we are at the top of the curve, and if we vary the number of particles by a very small amount, the slo total slope is zero. You follow that one? So what we do in equation 9.25 is to ask how the probability of the, of the composition changes if we vary, that's the size, the ends. And you see it's the xi d probability dn. That's simply the first term in a Taylor expansion. 
first term, well, yes, the zeroth term is the maximum and doesn't change when we vary. Okay, so let us take the partial with respect to the n sub i of the probability. Okay? Yes? Mm -hmm. And we get equation 9.26. And 9.26 has the form it does because when we take the partial with respect to, for example, n sub 1 of 9.24, there are two places where the partial derivative can attack. It can attack the q because the partition function is a function of how many particles there are, or it can attack the exponential. And so you have two terms coming down, and you have now a sum of two terms. Now we pull a trick. And the trick we pull is to say that equation has to be true no matter which variation of the size we took, yes? Mm -hmm. So it's equally true for every single variation. The only way that equation can be true for all values of xi is if the thing in square brackets is zero, so the coefficients of the xi are zero. Uh, one way to see this is to um, imagine two values, uh, two sets of values of psi which differ only in the value of one of the variations. You subtract them and you're left with nothing except the one term. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, if the thing in square brackets is zero, it's a little complicated, but we can solve it and we can solve it for mu sub i. And if you solve it for mu sub i, you get that mu sub i is the partial of q with respect to n sub i. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now that mu sub i, a little caution here, the mu sub i you have just calculated is the mu sub i in the most probable state of the system. It's the value of mu in the most probable state. Mm -hmm. There is also the mu we introduced in the earlier section, the one that appears in 9.24, which is the chemical potential which lets us create the grand potential. And you want to realize that um, in the most probable state of the system, mu has some value, but there's sort of two mu's here. Okay, so having done that, um, if you look hard in 927, there are some derivatives of q and q, mm -hmm. and if you look at that, you realize you have 9.28, and 9.28 says that mu is related to partial of a with respect to n. Now that result refers to the most probable state of the system, and in 9.28, the n's have the value that they have in the most probable state of the system. Mm, we can do something else. We can say, let's calculate the average number of particles in the system and the fluctuations in the number of particles in the system. And we start with 9.29. And 9.29 is just what we would write down for the average value of n. That is, it's a sum over all possible values of n, and the numerator is the weighting factor for that value of n. It's the sum of all of the states that have that value of n, the sum of the probabilities, divided by psi, the matching num uh, normalizing factor. Well, that's an interesting form, but if you look at that form for a moment, you realize that form can, is actually the same as 9-30. It's the derivative of log of psi with respect to beta mu. Mm -hmm. Okay, well let's take 930 and we will take a and um, we will take a derivative um, or we'll take 929 and we will take another derivative with respect to beta mu. If you do the calculation, if you take the derivative of 9-29 with respect to beta mu, you get 931. And you see that the, the size of the fluctuations in n are, is determined by a second derivative of psi. Okay? 
Should that be familiar? Yeah, we saw something very similar. We took the second derivative of Q with respect to minus beta and out came the energy fluctuations. Um, just as we were able to re relate um, the energy fluctuations to the specific heat, we can also relate the number fluctuations to some thermodynamic quantities. Now, there is one key step, which is a pure thermodynamic step, which I'm simply going to say, this is a trick worth knowing, but we're not going to go through it. But I will show you what happens. So, most of these steps, yeah, it looks like we're doing things to thermodynamic derivatives. In fact, most of the steps are calculus steps, and only one is an actual thermostep. So, the first thing that happens from 932 to 933, we take the partial of n with res n average with respect to mu, and what do we do? We stick in the pressure as an intermediate variable. That's perfectly safe as long as we stay along a well, the well-defined path that we do. Okay, so we have dn, d, dp, dp, d mu. Mm -hmm. The next thing we do is to use 9-34. 9-34 is not an insert and intermediate variable. It's the cyclic permutation identity. Where have you seen the cyclic permutation identity? Hands if you remember it. It's in physics 4. It's the relation between the longitudinal velocity, the transverse velocity, and the slope. And if you look at that, yeah, the variables are different, but that's all it is. Uh, we now say we have something called the compressibility, the isothermal compressibility. That's 935. What's that? It's the fractional change in the volume of the system when you change the pressure. Um, we call, it's isothermal. But why do we have to call it isothermal? Well, suppose I take a gas and I change the pressure. There are bunches of ways of changing the pressure of the system and they're not all the same. And instead of varying the temperature, I could, for example, have the, kept the energy of the system constant. And if I'd done that, except for an ideal gas where I have to think about things a bit carefully, I'd get a different answer. Okay, 9-36 is the thing we're going to skip, except I'm going to tell you what it is. It is something called the Maxwell identity. Yes, this is the same Maxwell who did Maxwell's equations. He was also very interested in statistical mechanics and thermodynamics. Uh, the um, Maxwell distribution for particle velocities is named after him. That's a statistical mechanics result, which he found only for the ideal gas. Uh, he also did a bunch of things in thermo, and you're looking at one of them, and the Maxwell identity lets you relate two um, more or less unrelated sets of variables. Well, they're not really unrelated. P and V are complementary to each other, numerator of one, denominator of the other. N and mu are complementary to each other, denominator of the first, numerator of the second, and various things get held constant. That's a Maxwell identity. Okay, now we hit another math trick in 9-37. Um, and the notion is, the number of particles in the system is some function of the average number of particles of species and average. It's some function of the volume, the temperature, and the chemical potential. That's the equation midway between 36 and 37. Okay. Well, n is, depends on, it's on how big the system is. It's an extensive variable. V is the same way. The average number of particles is linear in the size of the system. The other side of the equation, n of vt mu, must therefore be linear in the size of the system. So if I pull a volume of v outside, what's left had better be independent of particles the size of the system, 
because the size of the system is entirely carried by the, the equation v. Uh, therefore, the um, function that is sitting there must be independent of how many particles are. It must just depend on t and mu. Mm -hmm. If we combine all this stuff and are clever, we find that um, n and v, or d average n dv, follows equation 9-38. And if we combine all this stuff, which is going to take a while, which is why we're not doing it, you get an expression for the number fluctuations. And the number fluctuations are determined by the compressibility, chi. The larger chi is, the easier it is to compress the system, uh, the less work you need to do to stuff more particles into a box, and therefore the bigger the number fluctuations are. Uh, if you divide through this, you can also determine the fractional size of the number fluctuations goes as something like 1 over the square root of n. So for a one particle system, we have one particle on the average inside this room. Gee, it's a vacuum in here. You won't have to suffer listening to me anymore because the space won't carry sound waves. Aren't you lucky? Only if you don't need to breathe. Well, in any event, those fluctuations fall off as 1 over the square root of n. Okay. Now, what does this tell us? Well, if you use a part of an experiment of the first kind to determine the average number of particles in the room, as n becomes large, the fluctuations become invisible. That's why barometers work. Barometer is measurement of the how many particles are in the room. A very funny, it's a funny sort of measurement, but it is. And barometer measurement just sits there. On the other hand, if you break out an experiment of the third kind, an experiment that is directly sensitive to the size of the fluctuations, like light scattering, you have the phenomena you can observe outside. The, notice the sky is this funny gangrenous blue color. Yes, see that? That light scattering, the luminance of the sky, is caused by the fact there are number fluctuations in little patches of air, and they scatter sunlight towards us. And as it happens, they preferentially scatter blue light towards us. Well, that's not a complete story on sky color. It's actually a very complicated problem. It includes overtone vibrations of water molecules, infrared absorption, it includes how your eye works, but the starter is number fluctuations. Okay, we are now done with sort of classical systems, classical separable systems. We shall now advance to part two of the book and separable quantum systems. And separable quantum systems starts out with the ideal monoatomic gas, a gas made of point <coughs> molecules. And if you did kinetic theory of gases, you could derive, only using one of the methods you've seen so far, that PV equals nRT. It's a prediction of the um, statistical mechanics of ideal gases. That's correct. You could also calculate that the specific heat of a monoatomic gas is 3 halves K sub B per atom, or 3 halves R per mole. So far, so good? Mm -hmm. Well, that calculation that it's 3 halves R assumes that atoms are true points. If you think they're spheres of some size, you might say, they also have totally slippery sides, and therefore there is no way to imbue them with rotation. Because if they were rotating, they could store extra energy beyond their kinet kinetic translational energy, and their specific heat would be wrong. So they're points. Well, I was very successful. Unfortunately, people insist... Now, how successful was it? Well, in 1880, there was this little problem. There was only one known monoatomic gas, mercury. 
and you can work with mercury and you can do thermodynamics on it. You want might want to run at high temperature so the pressures are higher. But mercury was the only known monoatomic. And the vapor pressure of mercury, well, significant, is not exceedingly high at room temperature. On the other hand, if you pushed ahead from mercury uh, in eight, the mid-1890s, people realized that there was a significance to the fact that if you isolated nitrogen from air, it had a different molecular weight than the nitrogen you isolated from nitri nitrate fertilizer. And it wasn't a little bit different, it was quite substantially different. And several people worked very hard to extract all of the nitrogen from air, and they discovered there was this chemically non-reactive piece which was argon, which was the first Nobel, Nobel gas to be unambiguously identified on Earth. Helium had actually been known for 30 years in the spectrum of the sun, where it's physically unaccessible to other measurements, but there was this funny material that had this weird spectrum. Now, there was, a, for good reason, hesitation about believing it had to be an element uh, as witness the well-known element, coronium. Have ever, either of you ever heard of coronium? Because it doesn't exist. Coronium is iron that has been um, heated up a great deal, and it's ionized, and its charge is something like plus 15. The spectrum looks very different. The people who saw it thought they'd found a new element. Not quite. Okay, so we push ahead, since there's only one monoatomic at first, we will push ahead and do the specific heat of a diatomic. So here is a typical diatomic molecule, and it's rigid, and it has three translational degrees of freedom. And since it's diatomic, it obviously has spatial dimensions, and it can rotate around each of three axes. And that means we can write its energy, its total energy, and if we write its total energy, we get the expression in the equation 10-18. 10-18 is a couple pages in, and equation 10-18 shows us that the kinetic energy has three translation terms, it has three rotation terms, and if you apply the equipartition theorem to this, Guess what? You can calculate the average energy as being 6 halves kT, and therefore the specific heat is 6 halves k sub b. Yes? Well, that's fine, except unfortunately there are diatomic gases wandering around like air, full of diatomics. And if you measure the specific heat of a diatomic, you get the wrong answer. get the wrong answer. Instead of 6 halves k sub b, you barely get 5 halves k sub b, or less. And you try to explain this away. Well, if you refer to figure 10-1, one of the things you could ask, how on earth could I explain this away? There's a hand-waving explanation which is given in many books. And the hand-waving explanation is to say, that the moment of inertia around axis 3, the long axis, is very small. And therefore, since it's very small, we can say that it doesn't contribute to the specific heat. Now that claim is total nonsense, and that leads us promptly to the homework problems. Since you will do problem 10-1, and when you do problem 10-1, which actually references figure 10-1, you will discover the claim is wrong. In addition to 10-1, you will do 10-6, 7, 8, and oh, 10 through 14. Now that sounds like a lot, but 10 through 14 are sort of turn the crank problems. 
and then turn the crank and you will get to do spins. Okay, how are we going to solve this? Are these due next Monday or next Wednesday? I think Wednesday would be okay. okay. I mean, I, there are a lot of them. But um, when I say some of them are quite short, I mean some of them are really short. Oh, I believe you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what do we do next? The answer is we're going to take a step back to 10-1, section 10-1, page 142. And what section 10-1 does <clears throat> is to discuss partition functions for separable systems. Well, we better start with something simple. What is a separable system? We have a system. It's full of things. The things have a set of canonical coordinates. Lots of them. However, if a system is separable, we can take the total energy of the system and we can chop it up like dicing a long st stalk of celery. And when we're done, dice, 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 we have all these little pieces. And each piece only depends on, in the case I work, <coughs> one variable. And because the piece only depends on one variable, life becomes simple. Well, how does it become simple? <coughs> Let's write the partition function for this thing. So the partition function, equation 10-5, is a sum over all states of the system. I have written the sum as a series of integrals, <coughs> but between them they represent all the states. And then I've taken the exponential e to the minus beta of the energy of the system, but the energy is a sum of all this term, these terms, and therefore I can take exponential sum of the energy terms is what of the energies? or the exponentials. Why? It's a product. It's a product of each of the, of, for example, x minus beta e1 times product, x minus beta e2, and so forth. I can distribute the, ex, the exponentials over the integrals, and I can, now, I can separate the integrals out, as shown, for example, in equation 10-7. That is, I have a series of integrals, integral over qi, at the part of the energy that's determined by qi. Yes? Mm -hmm. And because the exponential of the sum is the product of the exponentials, and each of those exponentials only depends on one variable, I can separate the integrals and I can do them all separately. You did this with the ideal gas. Okay? Um, so we are going to do that, and now I'm going to say, let's start with that partition e function, equation 10-5. The definition is sum over all states x minus beta e sub j. That subscript is not the same as the subscript in 10-5 through 10-7. Uh, the subscript j is just a energy in state j or state j lists all the variables. Let's take minus d beta dq. If we do that, we get the average energy. Yes? Well, in equation 10-6, I say the partition function, the whole partition function, is the product of the partition function of the pieces. So I will take the partition function of the pieces and I will stick it in equation 10-9. And if I do that, I realize that the energy becomes this sum of terms, each of which only involves the derivative of one partition function. Another way of saying this is that in equation 10-11, I have the logarithm, or excuse me, 10-10, I have the logarithm of the product, and logarithm of the product is the sum of the logarithms, which I've written as 10 10. <coughs> so you turn the crank, and you discover that each of these energies, E1, E2, and so on in 10 4, has its own partial partition function. Each of them contributes separately to the energy, and therefore, 
if you turn the crank and are careful, you get down to equation 10-15. And 10-15 says that the energy, the average energy, can be written as the sum of the contribution to the average energy due to each of the pieces. Uh, the one place you have to be careful, you might wonder, where did we get from 10-12 to 10-13? Well, um, we're going to, we're, what we're trying to do is to prove 10-11 that the average energy of variable i is d log qi d beta. There's a minus sign missing in that equation. And so you write that down and it's equation 10-12 and everything looks fine except the right hand side is not the average energy due to variable i. Why not? because there's not a complete sum over states on the right hand side. There really isn't. There's a, um, and if you want the complete sum over states, you have to put all of the variables back in. And I do that in 1013. 1012 and 1013 only differ because I've taken a whole bunch of terms, uh, integral dqn x minus beta e sub n over q sub n, which is just 1. And I have multiplied equation 10-12 by a very large form, Avogadro's number of terms and product. But it's 1, and I multiplied it by 1, and now I actually have the average energy e sub i there. Well, if you get 1015 and take a derivative with respect to the temperature, you say the specific heat is the sum of the specific heats contributed by each of the variables separately. So far, so good? Okay. And now we are ready for the next step, which requires a little quantum. And the question is how we write the energy of a diatomic molecule correctly. Uh, you may or may not get to this in grad quantum. I think you don't really get it to it in undergrad quantum. <clears throat> and the answer is, for a normal diatomic, we can write the energy as a sum of three pieces. And there is a piece which is just center of mass translation. Then there is a piece that corresponds to the fact that two atoms can stretch and contract the bond. This is a harmonic oscillator. See the harmonic oscillator? Oh boy. Yes. But this is a quantum harmonic oscillator, and therefore its energy is n plus one half h nu, mm -hmm. where n is an integer. And then there's a further part of the energy which refers to the fact that there are two axes around which the atoms may spin around each other, and that gives us a further energy bj j plus one. Um, J goes from 0 to infinity. The number of states having value J is how many? 2m plus 1. 2j mm -hmm. plus 1. And n goes 0 to infinity. And if we want, with some work, we can write out bottom of the next page equation 10-23. And that's the partition function again. And the diatomic can still be anywhere in the system, so there's an integral dr. It can still be going at any speed it wants, there's an integral dp. Yes, I know there's a special relativity issue in there. And then there is a sum over the allowed states, and there are three sets of quantum numbers. Uh, we sum n goes 0 to infinity, mj goes minus j to j, j goes 0 to infinity. So that we would say is a sum over a complete set of states. To which I will add, danger Will Robinson, danger, because I have just cheated rather massively. We will get to that in a later chapter. You will find this in almost every statistical mechanics text, and most authors fail to notice where they have just pulled a cheat. It does get to the right answer, but there is this slightly large intervening step. But it's okay. So having said this, well, 
we can take that partition function and we can split it into pieces. And we can split it into pieces because the energy is a sum of terms. Well, one of those terms is equation 10-27, which is the vibrational partition function because we have a vibrational quantum number that goes from zero to infinity. And so there is the sum of over states of the vibrational partition function e to the minus beta n plus one half h nu. Okay, so far so good. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> we can actually evaluate that. I suppose one question you might ask is how you evaluate it. And the answer is, there's an e to the beta h nu over 2, which is just a constant multiplying factor, which in 10-29 is, is extracted in front. And then there's a sum n equals 0 to infinity. But instead of writing it as a summation sign, I wrote out the first two terms as n goes to 0, 1, 2. And so there's a 1. There's an e to the minus beta h nu. There's an e to the minus 2 beta h nu, etc. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, do we recognize the term in square brackets in 10 29? Of course, there's a hint in the next line. It's a geometric series in e to the mi minus beta h nu. That series is 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed. See it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what's 1 plus x plus x squared equal to? It's equal to 1 over 1 minus x. So we can take the thing in square brackets, and it becomes the denominator of 10-30, and the e to the minus beta h nu over 2 is the numerator of 10-30. So there's q. So far, so good? Mm -hmm. Well, the next thing we can do is to say, if I've got little q, uh, the average energy is minus d d beta log q, and I can take that derivative, and I get 10-31. You should try taking the derivative for yourself. Uh, there is an alternative to the hyperbolic cotangent. It's traditional, but a, a choice of not quite bizarre functions, but at least functions you don't see very often. It certainly ranks up there. You could also write it as 1 plus e to the minus beta h nu over 1 minus e to the minus beta h nu, and an h nu over 2. It's a function. Okay, so we now have the average energy. And we now ask, how does the average energy behave as we change temperature? Well, one possibility is we take the high temperature limit, T goes to infinity. And if T goes to infinity, what does beta do? Goes to zero. Correct. So we will take the limit of this object as beta goes to zero. And if you do that, you discover you get an answer, namely E average is equal to 1 over beta, or KT. You'll actually have to do the, do the work, but you should realize if t is going to infinity, beta is going to zero, and therefore e to the minus beta h is hmm, 1 minus beta h. Mm -hmm. And so if you do the math, you find that at high temperature, you get that e average is kt. And therefore, at high temperature, the contribution of the, to the specific heat is k sub b. Gee, that's the classical result, isn't it? Right? Mm -hmm. Classical result, mm -hmm. termonic oscillator, two degrees of freedom, each quadratic equipartition theorem says each gives you k sub b over 2. However, you could also take the limit of low temperature. And if t goes to 0, what does beta do? It goes to infinity. Correct. And, um, if it goes to infinity, if beta h nu goes to infinity, then e to the minus beta h nu goes to... 
better go to infinity. Because we're going to cold now. Then e to the minus beta u. E to the minus infinity yes. is zero. Zero, yes. So e to the minus beta h nu goes to zero, and the uh, term, the piece of 10 31 that in the book is written as a cough, g, that goes to one. And the average energy is h nu over two. That's the zero point energy which in traditional classical mechanics, quantum mechanics, I should say, is inaccessible. And if the energy is just a number, the specific heat goes to, the energy is independent of temperature, the specific heat goes to d dt equal. If it's independent of t, I mean, you're taking it zero. See that? Mm -hmm. Yes, so the specific heat goes to zero because the energy is independent of T. So D, DT is zero. And therefore, um, <clears throat> uh, G, uh, there's no contribution to the specific heat from the vibrational motion. Now the one thing you have, would worry about if you're sensible is, um, well that's interesting, but which limit are we in for molecules of air at room temperature? And the answer is, there is a traditional infrared spectroscopic unit, the wave number, which is not the same as the physics wave number. Um, however, thanks to E equals H nu, quantum theory, wave number, correspond, wave number corresponds to a temperature, and room temperature is about 200 wave numbers. Back. Room temperature is 200 wave numbers. Uh, hydrogen atoms doing this are at about 3,600 wave numbers. So H nu over KT is 3,600 over 200 or 18. E to the minus 18 is pretty close to zero. Oxygen, double bond, much heavier, vibrates at something like, oh, 1200 or 1600 wave numbers, that's still e to the minus 8. The room, at room temperature, the diatomic vibrations give you almost no contribution to the specific heat. What about rotation? Well, we wrote it out in the book, <clears throat> and we will skip over it, but the short form answer for rotation is that rotation gives you sort of two halves kt, but the temperature dependent, you get a function that is temperature dependent, you can actually see it. Okay, let us chug ahead to 10-4 spin systems. Okay, I am not going to do all of spin systems, but I am going to get you to the first step. And once you have the first step, the homework will do the rest. So what is the first step? Here we have an atom or something, and it is a spin S system. Mm -hmm. If it is a spin S, electrons are one half, mm -hmm. but it could, doesn't have to be electron spin, it could be angular momentum. If it's a spin S system, the allowed states the uh, orbital states go s, s minus 1, the m, j, s variable goes from s, s minus 1, s minus 2, down to minus s. Of course, for spin a half, that means it's plus a half, minus a half, that's all the states you get. Mm -hmm. We mostly talk about spin 1 half. Okay? Now we are going to take the spin and we are going to put it in a magnetic field and after a certain modest amount of oversimplification the energy is mu s. Mm -hmm. Magnetic moment times s. So for, um, and we can extract the one half out and bury it in the mu and therefore the total <coughs> energy of cap of n spins is the number of n plus spins times mu b 
minus the number of n minus spins times mu b, or it's the number of n minus spins times minus mu b. This is a spin one-half system. There are two allowed spins. Mm -hmm. So I can write the partition function if I've got n spins. I can write the partition function by saying the first spin can be down or up, the second spin can be down or up, the third spin can be down or up, and yes, and therefore the list of all states is the list of all combinations of down or up. Said alternatively, it is, a, it is the list of all binary numbers having the correct number of digits because one, zero, yes. So I can write the sum over all states the way I do in 1038. So the first spin goes plus or minus one, the second goes plus or minus one, and I generate all possible combinations, and they're multiplied by e to the minus beta times the energy of the particular state. So far, so good. Mm -hmm. It's a separable system again. Mm -hmm. The energy can be written as a sum of variables. So e to the minus energy can be written as a product of variables, each depend, product of energies, I should say, each depending on one variable. And so I can partition this out as seen in equation 1039, which skips over to the next page, it's a bit long. And each of those terms, each of those sums only has two terms in it. So if I calculate q sub 1, which I do in 1040, uh, and for a single sp spin a half I can write it as 1041, there's the partition function. And instead of being a continuously infinite number of terms, it's a huge number of terms, it's two. And that's the partition function for one particle. Well, the partition function for all of the particles is the product of the one particle partition functions. There is then a math excursion where we do things different ways, but in the end, we have the partition function for n spins. Okay? And now we hit problems 10 dash, what were those numbers again? 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. And so you're going to calculate the average energy, and I tell you the answer. And you're going to calculate the specific heat, and, the and I tell you the answer. Uh, oh, warning. Every so often there's a typographic error in the book. So I have told you an, an answer, but you might be, want to worry that maybe occasionally it's not the right answer and you need to fix something. And then you do 10-12, which is the specific heat for um, high or low temperatures. And we say specific heat goes as t to the x, but at which limit? And you're asked to find A and S. You know how to find A and you S? Well, Q equals X minus beta A. And someplace back there is a relationship between A and S, which you'll have to find. Okay. It's a good review. A 10 14, we have a, a ring. And we are now going to get to why you were interested in this course interacting particles. Because in this system, the energy of the system is determined by a constant times at the product m1, m2. Yes? And now we sum this over all combinations of m1, m2, but each particle can only interact with two of its neighbors. You have to be a little careful writing the sum when you come back and the snake bites its tail. Mm -hmm. You just have to be careful, and it's not ma math complicated, it's like the picket fence issue. You have to be a little awake or you double count. Well, what I say is we now have this system of n spins in a ring, which can be solved with transfer matrices. Uh, maybe I should have brought that one up. There's one, it's a wonderful math tool, but you can also solve it if it's a three spin ring. There are only two cube combinations, and you can solve this simply by writing down the eight states of the system and computing the partition function by hand. 
If the number of particles was a bit larger, you would not enjoy doing this as much, but for three spins, this is no big deal. Yes? Mm -hmm. So you can just do the enumeration, and you can now do the same calculation that you've done before, average energy, specific heat, limits, all this good stuff, Helmholtz free energy, entropy, but you are now working on an inter interacting particle system. Mentioning interactions, I have run us over on time. That's fine since I ran late. <laughs> Class is dismissed. Thank <clears throat> you.